Pope Leo for Sunday's game. We're going to throw the greatest cardinal, pitcher Bob Gibson. Hello, everyone. This is Will O'Toole for another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. Today, we're going to reminisce about the life and career of pitching great Bob Gibson, who passed away this week at the age of 84. One of the reasons why I love to focus on Gibson is that as a kid, uh, Gibson was always in the talk about who was the best pitcher in the National League and in all of Major League Baseball. So I'd like to delve into that a little bit today and compare him to other pitchers of his generation, including Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale, Tom Seaver, Jim Palmer, and a litany of others. Uh, Just to start, I love... It's funny how things change in life. And growing up, I was never a huge Cardinal fan. I always respected them, but I always treated them as the National League's version of the Yankees because it always seemed that they won. However, one of the things that was near and dear to me about the Cardinals was obviously Lou Brock, as I mentioned in my past uh, Park Ridge discussions, but also Bob Gibson because he just was the uh, the quintessential professional pitcher on the mound. And just to prove that a little bit, well, let's digress a little bit again. As I always say in these Park Ridge uh, discussions and or podcast TV shows, whatever you want to call them, if something hits me, I I, I will go off on the tangent because I, I see this as even though I can't obviously see the viewers, uh, I kind of treat it as if we're sitting, having a sandwich together in a local pub and, uh, you know, just talking everything sports and how everything just hits you at once. And when I found out that Gibson passed away, I was really, really uh, quite hurt because, um, again, it's like with Tom Seaver so much. uh, if, If you grow up really watching these players perform a little bit of your childhood goes with their passing. And uh, with Gibson, I just always admired his stoic uh, demeanor on the mound, his workmanlike uh, effort on the hill, and his just, you know what, just a real meat and potatoes, no-nonsense approach to pitching. He wasn't always uh, with these convoluted things about how to throw his, his patented fastball or a slider or a curveball. It was just, hey, I get the ball, I put it in my glove, I look for the sign, which is usually the one I want to give the catcher not to reverse, and I throw the ball. So the batter better be ready, my catcher better be squatting behind the plate, the umpire better be ready to call my strikes because I throw so few balls or anything outside the zone. And you better either just hit it or take a seat. And I think uh, he really, even from opponents or rival fans, I think he earned their respect. I, I Really, I, there's two things that probably are the quintessential Bob Gibson uh, career makers, if you want to make, if you want to say. And that is 1968, of course, the year of the pitcher, when he was just unhittable with a 1.12 ERA, still the lowest in baseball over a season. And... Of course, I always think this, and it's kind of overlooked, and that's the 1964 World Series where a younger Bob Gibson, five years into the major leagues, uh, was really put on the mound against the vaunted Yankee machine. And of course, the Cardinals and the Yankees have a pretty good history in the World Series. Grover Cleveland Alexander striking out Tony Lazari uh, in the 26th. The 1964 just comes right to my mind. And uh, so they, and the fact that the Cardinals are the second uh, winningest team in Major League history in terms of World Series, there is definitely a built in edge or a, a built in rivalry between the two franchises. So him taking the hill in game seven, and it's interesting. I always love to talk about this when uh, we are discussing pictures of my brother my brothers, Jim or Ed, is there one pitcher that you would always want to take the hill in game seven of the World Series? 
And of course, you throw out the Palmers uh, of our generation. You throw out the Jim Palmers, the Tom Seavers, the Nolan Ryans. I always say flat out, and really, I don't get an argument or a disagreement from either of them. And they know Gibson better. I would take Gibson in a heartbeat. Why? Well, not once, not twice, but three times he takes the mound in game seven of a World Series. He wins two of them, loses the other, not blaming any one particular player. The Cardinals, uh, I think they were just bested by karma in terms of losing to the Tigers in 68, but everyone uh, who is a big baseball fan knows that unfortunately Kurt Flood, a great defensive outfielder, slipped going back for a ball and it cost a number of runs uh, for the Cardinal pitcher. And of course, it was too much, <laughs> even in the year of the pitcher, uh, for the Cardinals to overcome. And I lost a, a great game seven to the Tigers in 68. So for all his body of work, Bob Gibson was the quintessential, I know I keep using that word, but really, uh, there's no other word to describe him. He was the quintessential pitcher in Game 7 of a World Series, as was Lou Brock, one of the great hitters in World Series play. I just want to say this, though. Why Gibson is so loved, probably by baseball fans today who are becoming increasingly frustrated by the length of base, baseball games is this. I just did a quick little survey on uh, the time of games. And I'm going to get into 1968 specifically with Gibson. And it's not a misnomer that Gibson was a fast worker. You, uh, he really believed in economy of pitches an economy of being in, in terms of length of time on the mound. He, his idea was get the three outs and get back into the dugout. Wasn't too worried about strikeouts. Although he was, of course, basically has the World Series record for strikeouts in a game, but uh, would always get the big strikeout if he needed it. But I believe that Gibson, and of course, I've never seen quote unquote a quote from him stating that he just wants the guy to hit the ball. I think it's more this. I just want to get the ball, throw the ball, and either have the batter hit it or whiff, and let's just move on. In fact, he should have been years ago in charge of, Bob, how do we shorten the game? And there's already components in the game uh, to make it much, uh, much more compact. One is that there is a time limit on the books for pitchers to release the ball once they get it. Number two, you can just really push what they're trying to do today, and that is just keep the batters in the battering box. I laugh because I was just relating this story when I was talking about Gibson with my brother, and his name is Jim, and that's a significant thing, and I'll get back to it. But I was just saying that I don't know why the hitters step out of the box to look at the third base coach. None of them know how to bunt, or if they do know how to bunt, they refuse, or if they have to bunt, they lay down two batted balls that go foul so that they can swing for the fences. And I get the metrics and the fact that uh, one swing, of course, produces a run if it goes over the fence. I get all that. But realistically, the game has become wiffle ball. Strikeout, walk, home run. And I've told you how valuable walks are to the game. I'm not arguing with that. What I am arguing is this, the strikeouts that Gibson amassed in the World Series against the Tigers, they really pale in context of the game today. You can watch a game where there might be only 15 batted balls in the contest because they've had 20 combined strikeouts between the team. It's incredible. And rarely do we see the same kind of uh, base running abandonment that we saw, let's say, in the 60s and 70s. And I'm not just stating that we should just run like crazy on the base pass, but I think baseball with the metrics has stated that if you keep runners at first base, it actually leads to more runs. But there is excitement about running the bases. And I think too much 
uh, of the game has become too much station to station and one swing can do it for us. Really, the strikeouts then aren't really as special because everybody is doing it. Unlike Gibson with his performances in the 64, 67, and 68 World Series. Just to give you an idea, as I stated, uh, I've gone to my new glasses. Actually, these are my prescription ones. I was just doing a compilation of all the Cardinal games in 1968 and their length of time. And I broke it down to this. I just put under two hours, from two hours to 209, from 210 to 219, 220, 229, etc., all the way up to anything three hours plus. I just made it. Cardinals in 1968 played a total of five games that were three hours or more. Gibson pitched none of them. The only thing to Gibson that lasted more than two hours and 39 minutes that year in his 31 decisions, 22 and nine record. He actually pitched a game that went two hours and 55 minutes. However, there's a caveat. The game went 12 innings. Gibson pitched the entire game and won. He actually, the Cardinals actually had 14 games under two hours. Where do you find games today that last under two hours? You can't find innings that last under that are less than two hours long in some in some cases. But the Cardinals actually played 14 games that were under two hours. Ready for this? Gibson pitched seven of them. He pitched half of the games that the Cardinals played in under two hours. He pitched in. In fact, he had three games in which he pitched under one hour and 50 minutes. Two of them were against Gaylord Perry. And those, ironically, are, are two of his losses. Perry was the only, only pitcher that year to defeat Bob Gibson twice all year. And I'll get into his 22 and 9 record and how it's so. Really? <laughs> don't send me any kind of hate mail or any. Well, it may never get here, uh, the mail. But don't <laughs> leave me an email saying I'm crazy and stuff. But I always thought that his 22 and 9 record was really disappointing. And uh, the reason why I say that, and it's not Bob Gibson's fault. I mean, anybody who, if I were to say to you, I'm going to give you a guy who has 30 plus complete games. Uh, he's going to win the uh, National League pennant. He's going to go to game seven in the World Series. And, and this team obviously loses. But he's going to have an ERA of 1.12. And he's going to be, and mind you this, I'm even going to tell you this, and he's going to be the most dominating pitcher that year in the National League. What do you think uh, most people would say uh, the number of wins? Now, understand in context today, we're we'll only get 35 starts. I, I almost guarantee you that most people would think that he would win 30 to 33 games and maybe go like 33 and two. And let's say the two losses as a result of errors. But Gibson went 22 and 9 that year, mostly because, <laughs> just like everybody else, uh, all the other offenses, they were anemic. Gibson, though, here's the irony of it all Gibson lost five of his first eight decisions that year and then went on a run, 15 and 1 record. He was incredible during the uh, months of June, July, and August. Kind of falters a little bit in in September. Actually, at the very beginning of the season and at the very end, he actually compiled a seven and eight record. So he went fifteen and one through the heart of the summer, really putting the Cardinals ahead of everybody else. And not only that, but pitching in the sweltering heat of St. Louis and all the other uh, uh, other uh, cities during the summer of '68. It really is an incredible testament to Gibson. And I just want to take a look. I, I did a compilation of some of the guys he faced. Ready for this? Just like Seaver. Now, I didn't do all 251 games. 
it, it, see, see if I had a little bit more time. Even that, doing the 300 wins, and I'm not looking for uh, some sort of a medal. It took me about eight, uh, probably took me about a good 10 hours over two days to compile his, his records and then kind of break them down. I will eventually do Bob Gibson. Fortunately for me, he only only had 250. And that's another thing, too. And again, I'm going off on a tangent. I was always disappointed he only had 251 wins. But of course, Gibson was a, a different kind of guy. I think that uh, he, he had a couple of injuries. Actually, people don't realize in 67, he broke his leg and came back from that. And then later on, about 74, 75, even earlier, I think, in the 70s, he gets hurt. And uh, I think it's his knee, as I recall. So he wasn't really the same pitcher after his second Cy Young in 1970. Does win, I do believe, and I'm going to look this up in a second, he does win another 20 games. I know he won 20 in 1970 because he wins the Cy Young. It's amazing when you think about it. 68, it's Gibson. 69, it's Seaver. 70, it's Bob Gibson. 71, it's Jenkins. 72 in the National League, it's Carlton. 73, it's Seaver. You have six straight years of future Hall of Famers winning the Cy Young. And in that group, you have Gibson with 250, Seaver with over 300. That's 500 wins right there. Carlton with over 300. That's 1,100 wins. And then I think uh, Jenkins finished with about 275, 280. So let's just say he had uh, 275. So you're talking about almost 1,400 wins between four pitchers. And the incredible thing is they were all in the National League East. And they all battled each other. But if you had tuned in about my show about Tom Seaver, it's interesting that Seaver and Jenkins really only met about four or five times. I even think it's less than that, as recall, with Jenkins getting the best of them. And speaking of Jenkins, Jenkins was the first guy to beat him in 1968. Jenkins beat him. Larry Durker, a very good pitcher in the 60s. Many people always felt that maybe... If the Astros had gotten, I don't know, maybe a little bit more hitting, and if they had found maybe a complementary pitcher to both Durker and Don Wilson, if they had found a lefty in the Astrodome, maybe we might be talking a little bit, and again, it's the if. Brother Eddie always talks about the if. It's a big word. It means so much, even though it's only two letters long. But let's just presuppose. Can you imagine if the Astros had gotten maybe a third stud pitcher? Because those two guys were very good pitchers. Maybe not, obviously not on the level of the Seavers and Gibsons. But there is no general manager that wouldn't take them on their team. No general manager. In fact, I'd even think about this. You put Wilson and Durker on those big red machines, teams of the 70s. You know, you might be talking about a team that wins 120 games during those years. And maybe not only that, but they're competitive. Maybe they bounce back after the 70 loss in the World Series to the Orioles and move on and win in 71 and win in 77 over the Dodgers and then win again in uh, 78. It could have been oof, very bloody and ugly for the National League West if they had those two uh, pitchers there during the 70s. Anyway. He loses to Woody Fryman, another not bad pitcher. I know he's over 500. He's what we would call serviceable, a good number three, maybe number four. Uh, Fryman kind of comes into play. Uh, ironically, it's Fryman who's traded to the Reds for Tony Perez. So the uh, Expos get him, Tony Perez, to play for them in the 77 season or the start to 78 season. But Woody Fryman serviceable pitcher, played for the Phillies, the Expos, did some nice work for the Tigers, especially in their 72 championship run. Gibson loses in his last year to this pitcher, and that's Don Drysdale, a Hall of Famer. 
And I know that many people think that Drysdale, his numbers might be a little overrated. He did play in Dodger Stadium. But regardless, Drysdale was a very good pitcher. I don't know whether I would, thinking about it today, I don't know whether he's in the same realm as maybe a Gibson or Seaver. But I know he's better than Sutton, a guy who also beat <laughs> who also beat Gibson that year. I know he's better than a guy like Sutton who's in the Hall of Fame. And uh, maybe not obviously at the same level as Colfax and, as I said, uh, Jim Palmer. But certainly up there as maybe a, a top 10, maybe top 12 pitcher in, in his generation. And I know that I'm going to get arguments about that. Um, did win over 200 games. I think in Drysdale that year in 68 does set the record, which is bro was broken by Oral Hershiser, uh with consecutive scoreless innings. Um, the other guy who beat him was a guy named Gaylord Purry. Now, I don't know whether he put grease on the clock and set it back a little bit, but the two games that he faced Purry in, the first game went an hour and 42 minutes. Guys, that's 102 minutes. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, that's 102 minutes. An hour and 42 minutes or an hour and 42 minutes. That's 102 total minutes. And then the second game was oh, a little bit longer, an hour and 49. Both games, Perry beat him. I believe the second game that Perry beat him, he beat him one nothing. So you can see where I'm going with this, too. Of his losses, Gibson, Gibson, uh, oh, okay, let's just stay with this. Then he loses to a very good pitcher, probably known more for his 18-1 and record with the Pirates, Elroy Face. But when I was doing a little research on Face, he's only about 20, 20, maybe 25 games above 500 in his career. He did make six all-star teams, and I know he was in the bullpen. Because when he registered all those wins, 18 and 1, he was mostly coming out of the bullpen. Again, not a bad pitcher. And um, the the one pitcher that you might say is, ooh, I don't know about this guy. He, he got beat by San Francisco's Bobby Bolin. Now, Bobby Bolin, Purry, and Don Sutton, who also defeated him, were the only three guys that – Gibson didn't get revenge on that year, <laughs> but he beats Jenkins. He beats Durker. Actually, ironically, Durker is his last win of the season, number 22. I'm looking at it right here on Baseball Reference, game uh, 160. He beat him one nothing, And, of course, they were 96 and 64 that year. The Cardinals, they finished 97 and 65. Um, when you think about it, well, I don't even want to think about it, but if you took Gibson's 22 wins out of that, they're probably just an also-ran team. Team, Actually, they needed – they did win the uh, the National League by nine games. Um, probably if Gibson – just just think if Gibson didn't even win uh, those 20 – he really had to win those 22 for the Cardinals to really get over the hump and into the World Series of 68. Anyway. Gibson pitches seven games that are under two hours. He pitched another 11 that were under two hours and nine minutes. In fact, that's one third of the Cardinals game. See where I'm going with this? And then he pitched another four games under two hours and 19 minutes and five games. Now, this is where he gets a little bit. Uh, he pitched five games that lasted at least two hours and 20 minutes. But of those, the Cardinals played 21 games that lasted at least two hours and 20 minutes. So he was only responsible for 20% of them. It's amazing. He was only responsible. The Cardinals played 36 games that lasted from two hours and 10 minutes to two hours and 19 minutes. And as I stated, he only he pitched 11 of the 33 or 31 contests that went either two hours and nine minutes or less. So Bob Gibson was a man of incredible economy on the mound. Just give me the ball and just get ready. Uh, Gibson, 1968, 
didn't beat a bunch of tomato cans. In fact, I made a list. He beat Jenkins. He beat Seaver. He beat Drysdale. He beat Marischal. He defeated ne Phil Necro in back-to-back -back games. And of the lesser known, oh, uh, uh, he does lose a, a Sutton, who's a Hall of Famer. Actually, overall, he's five and five against Hall of Fame pitchers. I don't really think you can ask more, for more than that from a pitcher. And I know this, that when I do do his stats overall, I am sure that like Tom Seaver, he has a winning overall record against Hall of Fame pitchers or Cy Young. Even here, uh, he did beat a guy by the name of Gary Nolan, who had some pretty good years with the Reds. I know he had arm trouble. He does beat Chris Short, who had a fantastic year in 64 with the Phillies. He does beat a number of all-stars. As I stated, he beat Necro and, uh, excuse me, he beat Larry Durker and Don Wilson, both all-stars. I don't know whether uh, they each won 20. I think Durker wins 20 in 1969. I can just take a quick look. Just give me a, a second here and I can take a quick look. Um, but he does beat Durker after losing to him early in the season. And, uh, of course, every time I want to go to this, Actually, why I'm looking him up, let's take a look at this. Some of his baseball cards, because they are great, and I wanted to just show this to you. By the way, a little background information. I've, I've, I continue to look for Larry Durker. Sometimes the machine just dies on me, and I, 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 I apologize. But one thing I didn't realize, I knew that he grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, he did go, he's one of several children. I think he was the youngest in his family. He got introduced to sports very early in his career, which was a good thing because uh, he was, in, uh, his dad died very young, I think after his birth or immediately before his birth. Uh, and uh, he's a good enough athlete. I know that he worked a job during high school as well. I know that uh, just because we had a member in our family who actually went to school with Bob Gibson way back when and uh, said that not only did he play ball, three sports, but he also worked, I think, even full time while he was in high school or quite a few hours. Yes, Durker won 20 games in 1969, and uh, he was an all-star that year and in 1971 with 12 and 6. And here's my point. Durker probably playing with maybe a better team that could – hit the ball a little bit better than the Astros. Although they've also often said that you take the Astros out of the dome and some of their hitters are really, really much better. How do I know that? Well, Joe Morgan comes out of the dome and he becomes an MVP and a Hall of Fame player. And everyone sees his skills when he's traded to the Reds. And Riverfront wasn't that conducive to offense. It's not that, it's not like a Fenway or a Wrigley. Um, but he has a 531 winning percentage all the time. Here's Bob Gibson in his first year. Uh, this is a 1960 uh, baseball card. And, of course, the Cardinals are wearing those dark blue hats. I really like the red hats better. I mean, if they're Cardinals, why not be red? I love the gray uniforms rather than the, uh, the powder blue. This is a car. I think this might be from 1968. Please. I'm not the world's, I collected cards, but not with the same obsession or love that, well, I shouldn't say that, but I didn't have the same love as, let's say, a hobbyist who collects them and knows their value, can tell you the difference between all different types of, whether it's mint or what number it is in terms of one through 10, etc. This is a great picture of Gibson. And you can tell this is spring training. I could always tell it was spring training because take a look at the uh, red undersleeve that he has. That is a windbreaker. So, you know, this is probably uh, one of the uh, pictures taken in Florida during spring training. But you can just even see Bob Gibson was a very, and I know this is the cliche today, he's the very intense player. I think even you could see it then, even in practice, uh, very serious nature, workmanlike. Uh, he didn't do yeoman's work, though. He was a king on that mound.
This is 1975, his last year in the league. Gibson, of course they have his name signed and all the rest of it. This one is about 1970 or 71. Used to love collecting these as I was trying to collect uh, a full set in 70 and 71. These are the Sporting News All-Star uh, pictures. So I know Gibson made the All-Star team. 71, 70, 69, 68. The irony uh, was that you always think that when you're having that one glamour year uh, for a pitcher that you usually get the uh, to, to be uh, the first guy out to be the all-star uh, pitching starter. That was not the case for Gibson in 68. In fact, he doesn't even make an appearance. Now, it's probably because in 68, and I'm sure I can go back on this. He probably pitched uh, maybe that Sunday before the game was played, and uh, they wanted to hold him out for fear of injury. Remember that his manager was Red Shandies, who won the 67 World Series with the Cardinals. So he was probably holding him out. It's a shame that he didn't pitch in probably his greatest season and one of the greatest pitching seasons in baseball history. This is the one I remember. I believe this is a 1970 card, and you can see this is at Shea. Those are the Cardinal Gray uniforms. That's the ones I really like. Um, I love the St. Louis logo, the ST and L. I love the red. It's a very glorious red. And even the smile on Gibson in this particular picture. Oh, this is 1967. Okay, I apologize. Very similar, though, in look to the 1970. But I can tell you this. I know this is their road uniform. This is probably at Shea Stadium, more than likely. But you can see, once again, the gray, and I love the red baseball cap. And I know they had a poll uh, asking baseball fan what team has the best uniforms. I know the Yankees won it. And I know everybody loves that pinstripe with the NY, which is a very unique calligraphy. It's based on a New York uh, subway token. It's not really its own calligraphy. Those two letters are their own uh, unique form of lettering. But I always like the Cardinals. I mean, the name of the team, Cardinals, shown perfectly. What sport do they play? Yes, baseball. How do you know? The two cardinals, and of course, it is a plural pronoun. So there's not one cardinal there, it's two. And it's on a baseball bat. So we know what the sport is. And of course, the cardinals is scripted. And it's a beautiful script. It's not a typical script. I wish I had a better picture of the cardinals itself. But it's a beautiful picture. And I always thought they, oh, here's a better one. Now, you're going to laugh when I say this. I don't like that white uniform. I like the gray. It looks so 1940s, I guess. You know, it all evokes in my mind Stan Musial or Pepper Morton, even Leo DeRocher. Um, but Gibson, fantastic pitcher. One other thing about him, 1964, uh, I'll just give you this, 1964 with the Cardinals. Oh, here's another one. In 71, I wanted to mention this. 71, he defeats the world champion Cardinal, uh, Pittsburgh Pirates that year. He beats them 11 nothing in a late season game, uh, August 14th, 1971. Gibson is only 11 and 10. See, I think he may have hurt his knee in 71, or it was starting to go on him. But he had a down year, 11 and 10. You would be seen as a savior on some team staffs today. But here he is. He's 11 and 10. It was one of the few times where the Cardinals lambasted the, the Pirates that year. Uh, they scored five runs in the first. That's too many runs to give to Gibson if you want to beat him that night. Cardinals uh, had 16 hits in the game. And they beat the Pirates as Gibson surrendered no hits, walked only three batters, and had 10 strikeouts. 
And as a kid, when the guy registered double digits and strikeouts, you're saying, wow, what a pitcher he is. It was few and far between. His ERA on that day, 3.22. If you are a Cardinal fan or a baseball fan, you're saying, man, he's 11 and 10, 3.22 ERA. He's having a terrible year. Most guys would give, uh, interestingly enough, ready for this, two of the pitchers, well, I can't say, Bob Veal was in the game, one of the pitchers who defeated him that year in 1968 for the Pirates. Now, he was another pretty good pitcher. So, like I said, he wasn't losing to tomato cans, as a buddy of mine would like to say. He was beating some good, good, uh, pl- uh, good pitchers in 68. The Pirate... Offense that year, remember, they they were called the Lumber Company. Here's their lineup. Dave Cash, Vic Davileo, Al Oliver, very good hitter. I think if Oliver is the type of guy, I think if he had really gotten this on stage and, and performed in the postseason, uh, besides the 71 season, I think you would have really appreciated uh, his skills. He's a really, he is a really solid ball player. They had Willie Stargell, of course, uh, not the MVP that year, but he was hitting 302. He went 0 for 3. Milt May, Bob Robertson. Now, interestingly enough, the guy missing from the Pirate lineup that night was Roberto Clemente. So they had playing right field, Vic Davileo. I don't think anybody <laughs> would ever, ever mistake Vic Davileo for Roberto Clemente. Um they had a guy named Jackie Hernandez. And just an off thing, if you take a look at Game 7 of that 71 World Series, the Pirates were playing metric defense baseball then. Take a look at him and where he's positioned in the bottom of the ninth inning with the Pirates up 2-1. He's playing over second base and then actually makes a play where he actually is in on the second base side of the diamond and throws out. I think it was... Might have been Boog Powell or Merv Redman. I can't be sure about that. Take a look, though. Hernandez played a very good short for the Pirates in that series, and they were a little bit uh, worried about it. Anyway, um, so Bob Gibson does pitch a no-hitter in 1971. Uh, In 1970, just to give you an idea about this guy, he, he really is just incredible, just to give you an idea. You know, Gibson was a heck of a hitter, too. And if I can find his stats, and of course, I'm, I'm running around here. Gibson uh, finished, by the way, with a war of 89.2. And I'm not going to digress into that. Here's what his postseason. He was 7-2. And two. And, I, and I'm remiss not talking about his postseason. Because he would be my starting pitcher. Lou Brock would be uh, somewhere in my outfield. He was 7-2 and two with a 1.89 ERA. In 68, he pitched three complete games in every series. He has 81 innings pitched in World Series history over nine games. He pitched complete games in eight of them, or or he had eight complete games, pardon me. He had two shutouts. He registered 92 strikeouts and gave up 17 walks. Put it this way, he had a seven and two mark in the World Series. Can you imagine if that if he was able to do that during a regular season? I mean, <laughs> I know this is going to sound crazy when I say this, but in seven in sixty eight, he only has a twenty two and nine record. It's seven. It is. It's a seven ten winning percentage. But <laughs> um, other years were kind of. It, it's like I said, Mickey. Uh, Mickey Lolich, who I've always maintained was the real MVP for that Tiger team, he won three games in the World Series. If you, t- but I'm thinking about Mickey uh, Denny McLean here. He won 31 games. Yes, he had an ERA of 1.96. But I don't think anyone would mistake 
McLean as being as dominating in 68 as Gibson was in the same year. He was just an incredible, incredible pitcher. He did, I just want to say this, that was the only year, ironically, that he did lead the league in ERA, but he does finish his career with an under three ERA, 2.91. He only leads the league once in complete games. He does lead the league, though, ready for this, in shutouts three times, and he did four times, pardon me, and he compiled 56 for his career. And he pitched over 3,800 3, innings, and he struck out, ready for this, over 3,100. I believe I was uh, reading an article. I think he was the second pitcher to amass 3,000 strikeouts in a season. Once again, I've lost a little bit of childhood with the passing of Bob Gibson. Uh, just a special shout out too. I'd like to thank all my viewers who watch the show and Howard Fredericks for producing. And uh, a sad note, but it was great to go over an unbelievable career of pitcher Bob Gibson of the St. Louis Cardinals. This is Willow Tool. For Park Ridge Sports. Thank you again for allowing me to come into your homes. And you can see more of my cartoons at O'Toons Cartoons. Thank you again, and I'll be here next week.